okay? Alla... Okay, uh, right. First of all, I just want you to say thank you very much for the invitation to speak. Uh, it is obviously a great pleasure and, uh, uh, you know, it's sometimes uh, we don't think we are living now a problem. Obviously, it's a big global problem, but is, this is generating also some opportunities, which is to link up uh, between different countries and uh, collaborate. You know, also people are far away from each other. So that's a, it's a little bit of a silver lining to this dreadful problem that we are all experiencing. And maybe that's something we should carry on doing after the crisis is over, is to remember that the planet is very small and, and we can all be connected and we can all uh, help each other. Um, the other thing I would like to say is that I'm especially grateful to uh, my friend and uh, colleague, um, uh, Vijay Sate uh, for, for the invitation. We have known each other for a long time and, uh, and we have always looked for possibility uh, to help each other and collaborate and so this is one of them. So uh, thank you Vijay and uh, it's always a pleasure to deal with you and your students in your university. Um, the subject I'm going to talk about is uh, has to do with Romans and uh, with Roman Britain and with husbandry innovation. Uh, this may be a subject that for people, especially working on Indian archaeology, which is not necessarily the case for all of you, uh, but I said it will be the case for uh, many of you, uh, may look a little bit remote. Uh, but uh, I just thought it could still be of some interest, uh, maybe no, uh, perhaps to some extent in terms of the archaeological questions, but also in terms of the approach to answer those questions. Okay, so that's that's the reason why I suggested it is something that you perhaps can see potential application in your own study and uh, and work too. Um, okay. I will move ahead. Um, the Romans uh, play uh, a very important uh, role in the history of husbandry, uh, which is uh, a role that goes beyond even the area occupied by the Romans and has had influence in many other areas in following centuries. One of the uh, key aspects, at least uh, in the part of the world in which we operate, and a lot of what you will hear, uh, obviously my paper, my prayer seminar is focused on Britain, uh, but uh, I will talk largely uh, about Europe and the area, obviously, uh, which is the focus of the Roman Empire. Uh, uh, but uh, in this area, uh, the Romans uh, also, the Roman period represents the first time when we have abundant uh, historical evidence, which is also associated with our study of uh, the relationship between humans and animals. Okay, of course, written sources are much older than the Romans. Even in Europe, we have the Greek world, but of course we have the Egyptian world, we have the Middle Eastern world, we have the Far Eastern world, and of course in India we have some very ancient civilizations we're writing to. But what is typical, however, of the Roman period, as what you can see in this slide, is the representation of a few books like the treatises by Cato on farming, Varum farming, Columella de Re Rustica, in which they write specifically about agriculture, about husbandry. They are like, almost like modern handbooks, okay? And that's, that is new. So for the first time with the Roman period, we have an abundance of evidence that allows us to integrate the archaeological evidence with written sources. Mm. Uh, another book which is very important in terms of the writing is uh, the book by Pliny, uh, which you can see here represented. And uh, Pliny is not uh, uh, a farming writer, 
uh, a writer, but he's rather a natural historian, a geographer, and uh, also tells about uh, lots of different traditions uh, in, in keeping animals, interacting with animals and the animals themselves and the plants, of course, and the environments. And that is also a very valuable source for us to investigate the Roman period. So the Roman period, because of the interaction between the archaeology and history, plays a very um, peculiar and unique role in our history and understanding of the history of the human-animal relationship. Okay, in addition to the farming treatises and in addition to the natural history books, there is also something that is entirely new about the Roman period, is that we have the very first cookery book uh, this is uh, the one writing uh, written by Apicius. You can see a representation of the book here in its English translation. And Apicius uh, wrote mainly for the upper class. Okay, and one reason why I'm accompanying the cover of that book with a, um, a, a, a figurine, uh, a, this is a bronze figurine representing a man uh, with, a, with a pig, is because the Apicius cookery book is entirely dominated by meat recipes which rely on the consumption of pork. Okay, so pork was the favorite meat by the Romans. And, um, and uh, this is also very much reflected in the archaeological evidence that we have from Italy that shows an utter predominance of pig bones in comparison to the bones of other animals. Now, uh, this causes us an opportunity, which is comparing the historical and the archaeological evidence, but also with a potential question and a problem, which is these historical sources are very much focused on the area where Roman culture originated, which is Italy. And to some extent, they talk about some other Mediterranean areas, but that the Roman Empire became very big and involved uh, North Africa, the Middle East, and especially areas of Central and Northern Europe. So the question is, to what extent we can apply uh, what the written sources say uh, regarding Italy and the Mediterranean to these other areas of the empire. For instance, is this um, uh, emphasis on pork consumption something that we find elsewhere? That generates what I think is a very interesting historical and archaeological question because it has to do with the way culture is transmitted. If the Romans had this preference for pork, did they transmit this cultural trait to other areas? Before I get into this question a little bit more, just very quickly, I wanted to mention that, of course, although pig played a very, very important role in, uh, in Roman uh, diet and consumption, uh, uh, obviously the Romans had many other domestic animals. Obviously, they had sheep, they had goats. Uh, that uh, this pair of uh, uh, scissors that uh, from uh, found from a Roman site was uh, is a shearing tool. So basically, was used to get wool from sheep. But of course, sheep would also be used for milk. Okay. <clears throat> and then I said cattle. Uh, sorry, I didn't mention cattle yet, but I'm going to mention it now because it's going to feature very prominently in the rest of this uh, presentation and the cattle was also very important for the Romans. And uh, uh, we have to say that uh, the Roman sources, okay, the written sources, hardly mention cattle milk, okay? But uh, it seems that the greatest emphasis in the use of cattle was for traction, okay? Remember that now I'm talking 
about the Romans in general rather than specifically about Britain. And, uh, and particularly, because I'm also making reference to the historical sources, those tend to refer to Italy and the Mediterranean world. Okay. One other aspect that was interesting about the Romans was the chicken uh, or domestic fowl. The chicken was introduced into Europe coming from the area where most of the people are listening to me now are from which because the chicken was largely coming from the footsteps of the Himalayas and from other areas in South Asia and very very slowly make it made its way uh, to the west towards the west uh, and Europe and arrived in Europe uh, in what we call the, the Iron Age, which is the period just before the Roman period. Okay, but in the Iron Age, we have very few chicken bones now and then in a number of archaeological sites, but it's only in Roman times that the chicken started being used uh, for substantially for as a source of food, and it became an important economic item. One thing that uh, we have to remember, uh, as I say, that the Rome, this is Rome, okay, the Rome came uh, from this area and then eventually spread in other parts of Italy and then they start building its, their empire. And this is uh, second century AD, which is at the time when the Romans had the largest possible empire. This is the largest extent of the Roman Empire. And you see, if we move to Britain, Britannia, as it's called uh, by in Latin, and it was called in Roman time, you can see that it's very much at the edges of the empire. One thing that is important to consider is because of the Romans were here in the central Mediterranean, in the western Mediterranean, in the eastern Mediterranean, they were in Asia, they were in North Africa, and then they were also in Northern Germany. They um, <clears throat> had the opportunity to create all kinds of links between cultures that were very different from each other. And the analysis and the study of this is actually very interesting. Uh, because of that link, one thing that the Romans are known for is that they moved animals from one area to another. Uh, so, for instance, peacocks that came from Asia, they got exported to diff many different areas. Although we don't find peacocks in Roman sites in Britain, we only find them later. But other animals that were spread around by the Romans were the rabbit, the fallow deer that you see here, and of course camels, which played a very important role in Roman economy, in Western Asia, and uh, in North Africa, but we have many archaeological sites, Roman archaeological sites in Europe, where camel bones have been found. However, not in Britain so far, but we have them in many other areas. So the Romans obviously used that big empire to create links and connections. Um, now then, now I want to show you some diagrams, and this gets a little bit more complicated, so I will try to go a little bit more slowly on this, just making sure that everybody is following. It's always difficult because I feel I'm talking a little bit here on my own. When I give a lecture, I always like to interact with the audience and ask if they're okay with what I'm saying, and you know, ask if they have questions anytime. It's not possible at the moment, uh, but we do what we can, and this is the best we, co uh, we can in these circumstances. So we'll carry on hoping that you are following me. Okay, you may remember that I mentioned before that in Italy there was a very strong emphasis on the use of pigs in Roman times, okay, and the consumption of pork. And one of the research questions is, is this culture was this culture exported to other areas of the empire. In order to address this question, what is very useful is the work that a colleague did and has continued doing for many years. So this is Tony King, who is currently at the University of Winchester. And Tony, uh, what Tony did was just look 
at the distribution of the three main domestic animals, the ox or cattle, the pig, and the sheep and goat put together, because uh, maybe some of you will have some experience of uh, uh, analyzing animal bones, and they will know sheep and goat are actually very difficult to separate. So sometimes we find it convenient uh, to group them, you know, to put them together. Okay. What Tony did was to produce lots of what we call these uh, tripolar diagrams. The tripolar diagrams are just a way to plot three different variables on the same diagram. In this case, the variables we are looking at are the different proportions of these three main animals, cattle, pig, and sheep and goat together. To make this diagram easier to understand, I have divided it into four internal diagrams. One, which is the top diagram, is where we have archaeological sites. So each point there is one archaeological site. So these are archaeological sites where, of the three species together, cattle represents uh, more than 50%. So any points that plot in this diagram has lots of cattle, okay? The same applies for the sheep goat. Anything that plots in this triangle has more than 50% sheep goat. So these are the sites with a strong emphasis on sheep goat. And in this triangle, you see the site with lots of emphasis on pig. Anything that is in this internal triangle, which is in red here, are basically sites where none of the three animals is very heavily predominant, okay? This is the situation for Britain with a number of different types of Roman sites, and I'm sure you can see that the most crowded triangle is the one where cattle is predominant, okay? And then if we go to pig, you will see that it's pretty empty. So there are only a couple of sites here and compared to the many sites that are here. That's the work by Tony King. So what Tony did, not just working in Britain, but many other areas of the empire that I don't have time to show you now, was showing that basically the pig culture, let's say, of the Roman period in Italy was actually not entirely, um, you know, uh, transmitted and exported to other areas of the empire, which developed or, or maintained different kind of cultures. So in terms of dietary preference and keeping of animals, the Roman Empire was very varied, and it would be a mistake to assume that the Roman culture from Italy was replicated and exported everywhere else. Of course, some aspects were, but not all of them. So in Britain, uh, in Roman times, we have a, a largely a predominance of cattle bones. Okay, because that is a characteristic of Roman Britain, where did this culture come from? Uh, was it a continuation of the culture in the Iron Age? As we will see in the minute, that is actually not the case. Because in the Iron Age, in Britain, we had a predominance of sheep and goat. So where did it come from? And now Tony's work uh, becomes useful because that's the situation for some areas in Central Europe in this bottom triangle. And you can see that here too, there is a predominance of sites that have a lot of cattle. Okay, so cattle, the cattle triangle is the most crowded here. So basically what Tony suggested, and I think he was right, is that the Roman invading army was in fact made of lots of people coming from Central Europe. And probably these people coming from Central Europe exported this tradition of having lots of cattle. Okay. Sorry, I messed up with the slide. So I'll move ahead. Now, let's focus on my own work on central England, which is just one part of Britannia. 
of Britain. And now you can see what I was telling you about in terms of the comparison between the period before the Roman period, which is the Iron Age, and the Roman period. In this pie chart, you can see that cattle is very common, is here in black. Um, sheep goat, however, is equally common, and pig is the third uh, most common species, still important, but not as common as the two others. When we move to the Roman period, you can see that there is no change in the pigs. Okay, so the Roman preference for pigs doesn't have any influence here. But what we have is that there is a clear increase in cattle. So you can see that in the Roman pie chart, there is much more black that represents cattle than you see in the Iron Age. So what Tony King was showing us is uh, also confirmed by this focus on this particular region. Um, there is also something else that uh, is interesting that we can point out. I will have to help you here a little bit because these tripolar diagrams are not very easy to read straight away. But this is a tripolar diagram again that you will have now some familiarity about reading it. And basically here I'm plotting size from different phases of the Roman period, early Roman, mid-Roman, and late Roman, with different symbols. I will add some polygons to help you the reading of this. So that polygon includes most of the sites of the earlier part of the Roman period. When we move to the polygon, that uh, is the one in red that includes most sites in the later part of the Roman period, you can see that it has gone up towards the cattle diagram, which means that there is an increase in cattle frequency going between the early to the late Roman period. This is important. It's important in terms of our understanding of Roman culture because basically what was happening here is that not only with the beginning of the Roman period, we have an increase in cattle frequency, but that phenomenon continued in the course of the Roman period. And basically so uh, it's uh, the, the Roman innovation is not just something that happened and then stopped, but it just continued in the course of the period. The other thing that also confirms a pattern that uh, um, Tony King had uh, highlighted is that when we look at the frequency of Roman sites, okay, uh, or rural sites, sorry, I meant Roman rural sites, you can see this polygon includes most, if not all, a couple of outliers, but most of the rural sites are here. When we move to the urban sites, we can see that uh, there is a similar pattern to the difference between early and late Roman period, is that a lot of sites tend to be more towards the cattle diagram. And you can see there is a movement from bottom to top here, which, see, which means that in urban sites, there is more cattle than in rural sites. And that's something that also Tony had uh, highlighted. And basically just to say, look, the rural sites were more connected to a culture that came from the Iron Age, where the urban sites, the towns, are more typically Romanized. Okay? Uh, it's interesting to see how also the age of the animals provides us some information about uh, this phenomenon. Now, you may remember that I mentioned to you that it looks like the Romans were mainly keeping cattle for traction. Basically, they, that means that they were using mainly cattle to pull a plow, so in order to increase production of crops. Okay, so um, if you use cattle for traction, you don't want to kill them too early because you can carry on using them for a number of years. So uh, lots of adults in a, an animal born assemblage of cattle normally indicates that uh, traction played a quite important role. Now, 
let's focus this pie chart div is divided into three main age groups okay the black is very mixed the white is mostly adults and the the the, the um, uh, this one the gray one is uh, the kind of younger group let's focus just on the black uh, okay and then you can see <clears throat> sorry not on the black i meant on the white let's ju just focus on the white and then if you look at the, the this first diagram that represented the iron age and that's the white and then you can see that there is a fair amount of adult animals but they are not predominant okay when we move to the roman period the white becomes much bigger and then later in the roman period so from the first to the second century a.d to the second third century a.d stays pretty much the same but when we move to the latest part of the roman period the white becomes very predominant so what are we seeing here well one we are seeing that in roman times without any questions in general most of the cattle are adults which confirms the evidence of the written sources that these animals were used mainly for for traction and the other thing that we see that this is a phenomenon like the increase in cattle frequency also the increase in cattle age is something that becomes bigger and bigger in the course of the roman period so once again we have an innovation that is not just sustained but increased in the course of the roman period so the uh, romanization of britain didn't just uh, um, happen and then that was it but it actually was a rather continuous phenomenon there are other things uh, that are new that uh, the romans uh, brought about uh, one of these is uh, basically new butchery techniques okay these are very very clear interestingly these new butchery techniques that i'm going to show you to you in a minute are not found at all in italy but they are found in central europe so it it, it seems to suggest once again a practice a cultural trait which is roman but doesn't come from italy but rich britain probably from central europe like the cattle predominance there are two main types which are typical of the roman period which we don't find at all in previous periods and we don't find at all in later periods and this is this uh, cattle scapulae or shoulder blades which have these holes and lots of chopping here near what we call the glenoid cavity okay uh, this hooked scapulae it has been suggested that they perhaps uh, uh, were related to the fact that uh, the horn, uh, the uh, leg of the uh, cattle was hanged on a hook that uh, generated this damage for the purpose of meat preservation uh, like uh, smoking or brining okay the other pattern that we found is uh, the so-called soup kitchen deposits those are very mysterious are they for fat extraction are they for soup making we are not entirely sure but what we know for sure is that quite often we are we find some archaeological context where we find lots of these bones which are all cattle and all very heavily charred okay and they represent quite distinct discrete and very easily recognizable context the interpretation of these butchery patterns is not easy it's not straightforward it's a little bit problematic but what we know for sure is whatever was the reason for this butchery they represent a typical roman trait they represent a typical innovation which is definitely present in britain and introduce into Britain probably from Central Europe okay now I want to talk to you about size of the animals okay what happened to the animals in terms of their size because it is often said 
that the Romans improved domestic animals. What does it mean they improved? Does it mean that they were better? Well, better or improved, they are very relative concepts. So let's say that they were better for increasing production, which is what the, the Romans wanted to do. But as we know very well from the world in which we live, increasing production is not necessarily better for the world, it's not necessarily better for a society, but certainly something that the Romans wanted to do is increasing production, increasing yield. And a larger animal will, pro will provide more meat, uh, of course, uh, but uh, what is key is a greater yield, you know, it's for the effort that you put, you get more food, okay? And uh, of course, because cattle were also used for traction, the larger size of the animals would make also for more powerful animals that it would be more efficient in pulling the plows. So if you look, this is uh, a histogram that shows the size of animals. So basically, when you go from left to right, these are small, these are big, okay? So big, uh, small, big. So when we move from left to right, we move from smaller to larger animals, okay? So the first histogram represents the late Iron Age, and the second histogram represented the early Roman period, this particular site of Elms Farm, Haybridge in Essex, which is in the southeast of England, which I'm just using as a case study, but believe me, it's a pattern we found at other sites too, okay? And then you can see that in this distribution, when you compare this distribution to this other, okay, there is clearly a move to the right okay there is a lot of overlap we expect that that's uh, this animal population we are talking about there is not a hundred percent change but what we are looking at is a difference in the mean and there is clear difference in the mean increases which means that moving from the late iron age to the early roman period we do have an increase in size of the animals okay and then when you move to other periods, that increase is sustained, okay? At this particular size, we don't have further increase in the late Roman period, but we do have that phenomenon at other sites. So in addition to increase in the number of cattle, increase the age, uh, introducing new butchery techniques, the Roman also brought about uh, larger animals. Those could be for two reasons and perhaps the two went together. One, you can generate larger animals through better feed, okay, uh, better husbandry techniques so you can improve the local animals or uh, perhaps in combination you are importing new larger animals from other areas. Let's go back to the chickens because they are quite interesting for the Roman period. Okay, I told you, you may remember that the chicken was introduced in the Iron Age, which is the period just before the Roman period. And here you see my example from my study area of central England. And you can see that there are some chicken in the Iron Age. Here is the Iron Age Roman transition. But look at the frequency here moving to the Roman period, much, much higher. So introduction happens in the Iron Age, but they become really important only in the Roman period. So it's another innovation of the Romans. Again, as we have seen in many other cases, when you move from the late Iron Age to the early Roman, mid-Roman and late Roman, you can see that there is a very gradual increase. So this is again not an innovation that happened just once. It did happen, but then it kept increasing. Okay, it's interesting to see when we move from the late Roman to the earliest medieval period, there is a drop in the pre pre uh, pre um, presence of chicken, but then it picks up much more in later times. <clears throat> um, 
the other thing that is actually interesting is when we compare the Roman with the Saxon period. The Saxon period in England is the period which is immediately after the Romans, when this population, the Saxon, again coming from Central Europe, invaded the country and generated a new culture. It's also the equivalent of the early medieval period. Okay, And what is interesting here in terms of uh, what this, uh, uh, this uh, diagram is showing is what is the frequency okay, of chicken in different types of sites and compares the Roman with the Saxon. And uh, if you look at this uh, uh, diagram, you will see that in Roman times, chicken is especially common in urban sites, also in military sites, which are known to be very Romanized. They are fair amount in a high status site, but when you go to rural sites, they are much less common. Okay, in the Saxon period, the pattern is not so clear. Okay. So uh, this distribution confirms the point that Mark Malt made a number of years ago, that domestic fowl were more popular on fully Romanized sites, but less readily accepted as a food source on native settlements, okay? So it's, uh, it's a little bit like uh, the higher frequency of cattle in urban sites than in rural sites. If you wanted in Britain to see fully full romanization, a big, big change in the culture of the country, really you had to go to the towns rather than the villages. Interestingly, when we move here, obviously we don't have the Iron Age because there are very few chicken bones in the Iron Age. But interestingly, this diagram shows the size of chicken. And when you compare the early Roman to the mid-Roman, you can see that uh, there is an increase in size. So not just cattle, and in fact, we know that for sheep and to some extent for pig too, not just cattle, but other animals were also improved by the Romans, including chickens. Maybe I'll skip this because we are running a little bit out of time. So I just want to, because uh, to conclude, I just want to show you another case study is another site I've worked on, uh, um, which is at the site of Earthbury, which is in, uh, in the south of Britain. Maybe I hope you can just see this little red dot here in the south. Okay, this is where Earthbury is. This is a plan of the site that this was excavated a while ago. Uh, it has a mid Iron Age, late Iron Age, and full Roman uh, evidence of occupation. Okay, so it was an interesting case study for us to do a comparison. Okay, uh, Mark Maltby initially studied the fauna, but uh, we had a project a few years ago with Sylvia Valenzuela Lamas and Claudia Miniti. We went back to the Matia because we wanted to collect more data, understand a little bit more about this site. Now, let's look at this site and let's go uh, to some of the things we've seen before. What this uh, uh, diagram does is very simple, just compares the three main animals and compares the late Iron Age with the early Roman period. And you can see there is a little increase in the frequency of sheep goat, which is a bit surprising what we have not seen uh, that, uh, uh, elsewhere, but each site is different. But in tune with what we have seen in other parts, there is a clear increase in cattle bones from the Iron Age to Roman period. And the main species that decreases is pig. Okay, so largely, although the sheep goat increases perhaps a little bit unexpected, but largely in terms of species frequency, a silbury fits the pattern we have seen in other parts of the country. This is a scatter plot, so it's a diagram that basically um, uh, shows uh, uh, two um, variables, okay, or two measurements of the cattle astragalus, which is the astragalus. I don't know if you're familiar with this bone, it's a tarsal bone, it's found uh, at the top of the foot. Uh, Human anatomists tend to call it talus, so in case you know this other term. Um, 
So this is the length and the width of the astragalus. And here in red, you can see the Iron Age distribution. Okay, that's the red. And in blue, you see the various Roman faces. Now, what you see here is very clearly there is a lot of overlap, but when you move to the top of the diagram, which means where the large animals are, the top is entirely occupied by the blue, which means that there is a clear size increase. Okay? Now, in Roman times, there are also small animals. Okay? There are also small animals. So, uh, uh, the Romans also had uh, small animals, but uh, they had also lots of large animals, which the Iron Age people didn't have. So the increase in size that we have seen elsewhere is confirmed as uh, silvery. Seen it in a different way, this is looking at uh, some other measurements, a combination of measurements using a particular technique that allows us to combine different measurements. And uh, you can see the distribution in this histogram, the red arrow indicates the mean and then we move from the uh, late iron age the, uh, to the kind of transitional period and then to the roman period there is a slight increase but when we move to the slightly later roman period there is a more clear increase so again it's a different way to show the same pattern which is an increase in the size of the animals okay the main reason why I want to show you uh, this case study is because I want to show you a different methodological approach, which in addition to the traditional zooarchaeology, which looks at frequency of species, age, the size of the animals, the butchery, we looked at isotopic evidence for this particular site. Our main question was, is it possible to see whether when we compare the Iron Age with the Roman period, is it possible to see whether there is any increase in mobility? Why were we interested in this question? Well, because we know that the Romans brought a kind of greater marketization of the economy and probably more trade and so the world was becoming more connected in Roman times. And therefore, a, a working hypothesis could be that we would have greater um, mobility in Roman times than we had in the Iron Age. But another question was, if we really have this increase in mobility, is it a gradual phenomenon or is it a sudden phenomenon? Okay. Or is it something that happens and just at one time? Or is it a gradual? Okay. Because we are interested in mobility, we looked for some isotopes which are good indicators of mobility. Okay. So by looking at the enamel of cattle teeth, you can analyze the ratio of strontium isotopic um values okay so you look at the ratio between these isotopic values and uh, we actually know that that ratio is connected to the geographic areas where these animals were pasturing when the tooth became formed okay so basically strontium can link our animals with some specific geographic areas. Okay, um, so it's a good indicator of mobility. In order to do that, you need to know where different geographic areas have different uh, uh, isotopic values. Okay, so uh, some colleagues who are geochemists uh, reconstructed this map of Britain that you see here and the different colors represent different strontium isotopic values. Okay. The um, main use of this technique is that let's assume you have a site which is here, okay, in this area here, okay. If on this site, okay, 
you find an animal which has a value which is uh, the equivalent of this blue which is up here obviously it can't have been a local animal but it's an animal that must have come from a long way away okay so it's it's basically uh, provide us with some idea of uh, potential uh, mobility okay um, the site of Osbury is here is uh, in this particular area which is a little bit at the edge between the green and uh, this uh, kind of uh, um, uh, light blue okay <clears throat> So those colors, remember, represent the different strontium isotopic areas, okay? So we looked at lots of cattle teeth here from the Mid-Iron Age, the Late Iron Age, the Early Roman and the Mid-Roman. And if you look at the horizontal diagram, basically, that shows isotopic value for the strontium, okay? The higher the value, Okay, the higher the value, the older are the rocks where of the geographic area where the cattle lived when their teeth were being formed. Okay, the particular area where the site is includes some rather young rocks, which means that um, uh, the, the local animals are supposed to plot within this particular rectangle okay however because the side is a little bit at the edge it is also possible that the green here okay represents also animals that may have been if not local not come from a very long distance however everything that comes from this area must have come from different regions and therefore were imported to the site. So the more points we see in this area, the greater the mobility. Now, these uh, diamonds, yeah, which are here white, and uh, the black diamonds represent uh, the Iron Age. The white diamonds are represent the Mid Iron Age, and you see that most of the points are potentially um, kind of consistent with local origins. There are only a couple which are just outside the area. When we move to the late Iron Age, you start finding more points that depart from the local area, which is here, and you can see them here. Okay. But when we move to the Roman faces, which are those in green, you see there are lots of points that depart from the local area. That's an indication that uh, there is an increased trade, increased mobility, and a greater proportion of animals that must have been imported uh, to the site. Okay, I will skip this diagram here because we're running a little bit out of time, but I just want to show you that difference in an easier way. So here is a range. We're using here as particular statistical tool to do that. That's the distribution in the mid Iron Age. Okay, that's the range, quite compact. Okay, when we move to the late Iron Age, you can see the curve is much flatter. Okay, so that means the bigger range indicates that there is an increase in mobility from the middle to the late Iron Age. But when you move to the two Roman phases, you see the curve is a even flatter, very, very flat, and the range has become huge, okay? This particular technique takes into account the fact that the sample sizes are different. So, because you might say, well, maybe the sample size in the Roman period is, great, is larger, this is why you have more value, but that technique takes that into account. So basically, the greater range in the Roman period is not a consequence of the greater sample size, but it is a consequence of genuine greater variability. Okay, the red is the local, and anything that outside the red can't be local. So a statistical test indicates a highly level of significance between the Iron Age Roman periods, 
and the increase in cattle trade goes hand in hand with the increase with pottery imports, uh, at least in the late Iron Age and early Roman period. So basically what we have is uh, the two questions we have, is there increase in mobility? The answer is yes. The second question was, is the increase sudden or gradual? And very much the answer is that the increase is gradual because in fact, you already see some increase in the late Iron Age, but then it becomes more extreme in the Roman period. So to conclude, um, uh, what we have is, uh, I have only scratched the surface. I could have talked for hours and hours about the different innovations the Romans brought about. There is clear evidence that the Roman husbandry was different in Roman times. There were changes, there were innovations. However, not necessarily these innovations were brought from Rome, but that they could have been brought from other parts of the empire which is again very, very interesting in terms of our understanding of the phenomenon of acculturation and cultural transmission. Okay. Um, in terms of the archaeological questions and the specific questions, maybe those may feel a little bit remote for you, uh, but at the same time, uh, perhaps some of these approaches may give you some ideas. And uh, in that respect, I hope this uh, uh, has been of some interest for you. So I'll be very happy now to move to Zoom and uh, see if uh, there are any questions. Okay, get to read it loud. Uh, um, so one question is, uh, uh, sorry, uh, I, I don't know who is listening to me now, so will will people be able to see the question or not? Ah, okay, right. I'll, I'll sum up the question in my answer then. Um, okay, so one question is, uh, uh, Romans brought with them a very distinct... Uh, a very distinct uh, pattern of animal husbandry, including very recognizable animal exploitation patterns. I'm, I'm reading the question, such as the use of cattle for traction, introduction of several species, the consumption of pigs and poultry from different parts of the empire. I was wondering about how drastically this pattern changes after the decline of Roman presence in Britain and the arrival of the Saxon. For example, you mentioned that there is even higher usage of poultry during the Saxon period, but seemingly more in context of a city with high status. Are there similar changes in other animal exploitation path? This is a very interesting question. Uh, I, I, I think one, I, I didn't have time to discuss about at the end of the Roman period, but it's something that we have investigated a lot. And uh, in fact, I have had a whole, my PhD student, Mauro Rizzetto, has done his whole PhD on this topic, and it's a very interesting one. Um, to try to sum up the situation, unquestionably, in the same way, there are very substantial changes at the beginning of the Roman period. There are also very substantial changes at the end of the Roman period. Obviously, that affects many aspects of the society. For instance, urbanization almost completely disappears, at least in the uh, soon after the collapse of the Roman Empire. Um, uh, but in terms of the animals, one thing that is uh, very interesting is that you may remember that I showed that the increase in cattle size, okay, and also increase in cattle numbers, both these phenomena are not sustained. So on many sites, especially in the areas that were more heavily Romanized, cattle size, cattle size decreases again, okay, decreases. And also cattle frequency decreases. So in a way, some people would say that the early medieval period gone back to the Iron Age it's not quite correct to say that because, of course, there are four centuries in between. But certainly one thing that is interesting is that the transformation of the society, the transformation of the type of settlement, the transformation of the economy, the lack of a centralized economy, 
we also think that one aspect that may have been key to this is the is the release of fiscal pressure that the Romans practiced. So the Roman uh, taxed the, the, the communities the, uh, very heavily, and that uh, uh, provided some stimulus to increase production. But obviously that system had gone, and that the stimulus to have a greater yield was no longer there. Uh, so basically, we do see that change. One uh, aspect that is very interesting is to compare cattle with sheep, because sheep that were, were always more connected to rural life actually do not decrease in size, but cattle do. So it seems that cattle seems to the animal seems to be the animal that is more uh, typically uh, connected. Uh, uh, to um, to the kind of the vagaries of the Roman period, you know, with big changes with the arrival of Roman and big changes with the decline of the Roman period. Uh, going to, back to the question of the chicken, uh, and the, the chicken, um, yes, there is initially a, a decrease in the frequency of chicken, but then it picks up again, because of course chicken was becoming very important in the economy of the world very gradually, and maybe it is possible that after the end of the Roman period there was a reaction to the emphasis on chicken, but then maybe influence from elsewhere brought to a reconsideration of that. Okay, and then there is a continuation to that question that I'm going to read. Likewise, so that's the question. Likewise, how, how much would an, uh, would an effect, uh, sorry, how much of an effect would the loss of the marketization enabled by Roman trade networks have had on the continuing pattern of exploitation in Britain during this time? Do we see stagnation in size changes and other morphology of markets, indicating lack of crossbreeding with imported animals? I think I have answered that question, and the answer is a resounding yes. And the person who asked the question explained it very well. This is exactly what happened. And, uh, and uh, in a way, you have the answer and the question together there. So I can only say, Yes, and I completely agree with that kind of um, analysis. Okay, uh, so Kanchana, shall I go with uh, to other questions? Am I okay to move to other questions? Oh, no, nobody can hear me now. Okay, so I'll just carry on. Um, a small observation. It's interesting that hooked scapulae are present at Roman sites in England as well. They also appear in size from the Indian subcontinent. Oh, that's very interesting. Yeah. Um, okay, thanks, Kanchana. Um, uh, um, oh, okay. Sorry, I have lost the thread here. Sorry, just a second, I need to find the question again. Yeah, uh, yeah. So, hook scapula present Roman sites in England, they also appear in sites from the Indian subcontinent as well, along with perforation metacarp. And as you mentioned, they were most probably due to the suspension of the animal, either for preservation or to drain blood from the carp. That's very interesting to know. Um, I, I, I suppose the question is where, uh, is there any cultural connection there? Is there any cultural link? Probably no, uh, not. Uh, but uh, uh, I suppose uh, uh, creating uh, some kind of parallel with biological evolution, I would say that uh, this is uh, an example of convergent cultural evolution. That's basically two patterns uh, um, which uh, are culturally disconnected. They develop and evolve in a similar way. It's very interesting to hear about their presence in India, and also interesting to hear that uh, it's related to the same, to the phenomenon that we we'll provide as a potential uh, explanation. So the other question is, uh, sir, could the, the curry pieces, chopped bones shown by you be food debris 
if not please give some idea we also get similar phone answer well as i said unfortunately we don't know uh, uh, uh we, well we don't think i don't think that they are simply the remains of ordinary meals i think we can rule that out because they are too consistent they are uh, they are only made of one species so they seem to be linked with some particular activity okay i can only tell you the suggestions that have been made one you know they they tend to be called the soup kitchen deposits because the origin the person who originally described them thought that they were chopping off these uh, cattle bones in small pieces and then in order to make a soup okay that's possible um uh it's a possibility uh the other one is that some people have suggested that the chopping was really to the production of glue okay so that's something else and uh, the other thing which may be the most likely is that uh, uh, people were trying to extract as much fat grease from the bones as they could is because we know that the fat is present in the marrow but the fat is also present in the structure of both the cortical and the trabecular bone and therefore by chopping it off and maybe boiling it perhaps the fat could be extracted and and used so I'm afraid we don't know for sure what was the reason and there are a number of suggestions about that and a number of hypotheses. Uh, I think one, what I find it interesting is whatever was the use, we know it's typically Roman, we know it's not found earlier, we know it's not found later, so it's a cultural indicator regardless of what was the purpose. Um, Kanchana, maybe you can reply to me on Messenger, but uh, I don't see other questions. Have I, am I done? Perhaps you can send me a message. Have I missed any question? Okay, well, uh, if uh, that is so, and you can see I can't hear you, but you can hear me, uh, I just uh, want you to say thank you again for the invitation. It has been a pleasure to uh, provide this lecture for you. I'm, sure, I'm sorry the system didn't allow us uh, to talk directly to each other, and uh, hopefully there will be such possibility in the future. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, thank you very much. Right. So, Kanchana, is it okay to close this now? <clears throat> okay. Right. In that case, thank you very much and uh, uh, best of luck uh, with, uh, with uh, whatever research or study you are doing. And I hope you, uh, I have shown you something of interest. Thanks a lot. Bye.